All right, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to another awesome Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants session. Thank you all for waking up a little early this morning. We don't usually do 9 a.m. Eastern sessions, so we really appreciate you all being here. For those who are new to what we do, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And in the month of February, as many of you may know, we kick out all the men. February 11th is the International Day of Women in Science. And so what we do is about 55 programs every single year celebrating the most amazing women scientists, explorers from around the globe. We've had astronauts, cave divers, zoologists, so many incredible people this month. And I'm so happy we get to keep it going today with one of my very favorite topics. And that is the blending of Arctic science and indigenous knowledge. These are two topics that have been really of interest to teachers all year long, in fact, ever since we were founded as an organization. And so today, we get to be joined by Matilda Tomaselli. So she's a veterinarian who gets to work as a wildlife health researcher with Polar Knowledge Canada, who's behind this incredible slate of Arctic programs that we've had the chance to bring over the last few months. So a huge thank you to Polar Knowledge Canada. She's going to talk to us today about her amazing work working with Inuit communities, these people that have lived off the land in one of the harshest, most amazing environments on this planet for thousands of years to learn more about wildlife health and make sure that we're keeping these incredible ecosystems and species healthy in the north. We're also going to talk about beans. I don't know what we're going to talk about with beans today. That's what Matilda's here for. So I'm very excited to turn it over to her in a minute to blow your mind. We cannot wait for your questions at the end of this broadcast too. And so without further ado, let's get to it, everybody. Matilda, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And thank you. Away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Jesse. And thank you very much uh, for everyone who's connecting today to, uh, to listen to this talk. I'm going to share the screen now and show my slides. Okay, Jesse, let me know when the PowerPoint works. You're up and full screen, it looks great. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So the topic of my uh, talk today is, uh, as Jesse mentioned, is a blending of working uh, with indigenous people of the, of the North, monitoring health of Arctic wildlife. First of all, I wanted to introduce a little bit myself and give you a little bit of uh, my background, where I come from. I come from Italy and um, um, early on in my childhood, I really wanted to, I grew up with, with animals. My, my aunt had a, a farm, um, so I really enjoyed to be around animals, and, but I really didn't know very much what I wanted to do as a career. Uh, and up until when I was a 13 year old and I went uh, with my parents on a, a week trip in the uh, Mediterranean Sea on a sailboat looking for joining a citizen science project looking for whales in that area. And that really um, hooked me. I was hooked to wildlife and conservation and much of my path um, as a career and as a study, really um, try to follow that passion. So I decided to, I wasn't really sure what to do, uh, whether to go into biology or studying uh, um, natural sciences. And then I ended up actually enrolling and uh, in, the, in the faculty of veterinary medicine. Um, I wanted to to study wildlife uh, uh, in their environment, uh, um, looking at the ecosystem, but also looking at their health. So I enrolled at the university and I had great opportunities to also go um, and study abroad from for one year at the, in the Canary Island for a there's a in Europe. There's a, um, a very nice learning European project that connects several university, and with that, I was able also to do an internship after graduation at as, in Spain on the mainland and in Valencia in an aquarium, and there I continued my passion at looking at uh, health of uh, marine animals. Those experiences really helped me. Um, get my first job that was uh, really in the heart of the Mediterranean Sea in a very small island um, called south of Sicily called Linosa is a 
fantastic island where a sea turtle, loggerhead sea turtle, go to nest. And there I joined a group of uh, biologists and conservationists who were um, looking after um, these beautiful animals. And uh, that, that experience, uh, I was working in a rehabilitation center, and that experience was really eye-opening um, because up until that point I had worked more with uh, captive animals and uh, in that in that case I really worked with people local people try to conserve these amazing animals and um, and I quickly realized that wildlife and looking at wildlife in their broader in in its broader environment what was I was passionate about that experience also brought me to write a book of environmental turtle conservation. And that really, um, really complemented very well some of other my of other passion that I have, which is uh, um, illustrating and drawing and painting. So after that experience, I decided that I needed to study more and I wanted to broaden my view. And the opportunity arose in 2013 when I joined the University of Calgary in Canada with a project that was quite different from what I had been doing at, up until the point and was looking at muskox health up in the Arctic. And was a project, an amazing project that I had the opportunity to join um, with the two great supervisors, Susan Kutz and Sylvia Checkley, the University of Calgary, who gave me this great opportunity to um, bridge in multiple knowledge system and looking at uh, uh, wildlife in their environment and talking with the people uh, that most, uh, the, no most, uh, the animal, which in the context uh, that we are talking about are northern people and uh, indigenous people of the north, Inuit. After that experience, uh, I was able to uh, get uh, a continue my research activity, not anymore as a student, but uh, as a uh, a researcher at the Canadian Eye Arctic Research Station, which is located in Cambridge Bay, in that red dot up in Victoria Island that you see in the map. Um, and the research station is a station of the federal agency, a government agency of the government of Canada. It's called Polar Knowledge Canada, whose objective is to strengthen knowledge of Canada's Arctic and strengthen Canadian leadership in uh, uh, the Arctic. So what I'm, I'm going to be talking to you uh, today is a bit of my, my experience as a researcher in the Arctic and what I learned through my, my journey. So first of all, why is monitoring wildlife health important? Well, I think that everybody um, now, after these uh, two crazy years of uh, pandemic, um, everyone has realized that how much the world is connected. It's not only geographically connected, so that something that happened in one corner in one corner of the world can really influence um, and have an impact in areas that are even farther away and, and very distant, but also that health of animal and health of wildlife is very much connected. And uh, health, healthy environments influence healthy people and healthy animals. This is very important in, in all the environments in the, uh, across the globe, but is, is particularly important in an area like the Arctic, where um, the health of wildlife directly contributes to the health of people. Wildlife provide, is a source of food for people. Many of the uh, Arctic wildlife are also harvested for food. And there's a, a spiritual and traditional and cultural connection with the animal. 
uh, between animal and people, which is very important to preserve. And so um, when we look at uh, what, so wildlife health and looking and monitoring wildlife health uh, is, is very much a component of uh, wildlife and environmental conservation, but also human health protection. So when we look at wildlife health, we are not only looking at uh, uh, diseases of individuals, but we look at health more broadly, looking at um, how um, the number how the number of uh, group of animals are doing, so the number of populations, uh, how many adults are there, how many young, how many young are born, and how many of those youngs can reach adulthood, uh, and so uh, can also reproduce and sustain the population uh, and sustain the species for many generations for the future. So. Looking at wildlife health has many, many challenges. But in an area like the Arctic, as uh, challenges are uh, very, very clear, um, the Arctic is uh, a, a huge environment and uh, it is uh, sparsely and scarcely populated. And it makes it very, very difficult to monitor how um, to understand how wildlife is doing and to monitor in their, he their health. It's important to monitor wildlife health in the Arctic also because uh, as, ev as every, everyone probably knows by now, know by now is uh, um, the Arctic is, um, is warming at a rate that is very, very fast, at twice as much as, as the rate of other places in the world. And this means that uh, uh, species that uh, were animals that were in restricted to more southern areas may move in in the Arctic and bring with them uh, also their parasites. Uh, and uh, Arctic population may not have encountered those parasites before, and so they may be vulnerable. So that's why understanding what's what's present right now in the Arctic also gives gives us a chance to understand changes that are happening right now and are that may will be happening and may be happening in the future. So I will give you an example of the research that I've been that I conducted to my during my PhD. The research that I've been doing has been up on Victoria Island which is in the territory of Nunavut. This island is huge. It's 200,000, over 200,000 square kilometers, which is nearly the size of United Kingdom. And in this huge territory, we have only two communities, Uluhaktok on the Northwest Territory side of the island and Ikaluktutiak or Cambridge Bay on the uh, Nunavut side of the island. In total, there's around 2,500 2, people living here My in, in the whole island uh, with Ikaluktutiak or Cambridge Bay being the most populated uh, community with approximately 2,000 people. This community was settled in the 1900s as an outpost camp of the Hudson Bay Company. And progressively, um, Inuits living around this region um, had settled in with the increase of uh, services provided in, by this community. So then right now, in this picture, you see how the community looks like uh, during the springtime, actually, is a picture that I took over the frozen ocean. And I was living over here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm 
at the beginning I started to study and I was living in Calgary, but then I quickly realized that, um, that I wanted to be in the community. And so towards the end of my PhD, I moved to Cambridge Bay. And then I wanted to show you some of the uh, nice wildlife and how the, the, the landscape look like. So in the winter, it's quite harsh. It's a harsh environment um, to live in. Here, this, you can see people are, 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 are moving on the... This picture shows people um, on a skidoo <clears throat> traveling on the frozen oceans. Some animals are, are obviously uh, still active in the winter. Here is a, uh, some tracks of an Arctic fox. And in this picture, you see some ptarmigans. So the, the winter is uh, it's a tough environment. Uh, it's uh, very dark, um, almost 24-hour darkness, depending on the latitude where you are. And in Cambridge Bay, uh, the sun stopped to rise for a period of time. Um, there's still a little bit of light, but for a very short period of time during the day. Um, the winter also is, although it's very harsh, is also an amazing time to see the northern lights, which unfortunately I was never able to take a very good picture of, so I didn't include it in the presentation. And then as things start to melt, the tundra and the landscape transform and it becomes lively from plants to animals. And even people become energized by all this energy. And the first signs that makes uh, everybody very energetic is the arrival of the snow buntings, who are the first migratory birds that in the Cambridge Bay area uh, arrive. So here you see from uh, Mount Pelly, which is uh, um, a mount close to Cambridge Bay, you can see all the lakes, all the freshwater lakes uh, um, melted. The tundra becomes uh, uh, blooming and the ptarmigan that once were white uh, to um, blend in the in the snow landscape now they be they turned brown to blend in a very different landscape and then many other animals are uh, become very active we get mosquito caribou arrive the migrates the musk oxen remain are always present on the on the island, also in the winter, but it's possible to see them in their majestic um, uh, expressions. And uh, and here, I this this second picture that I'm showing you is a picture of uh, a grizzly bear paws. Um, that grizzly bear are sighted more commonly now in Cambridge Bay and they move northern as a consequence of finding a, a suitable habitat for them. And this is a change that happened more in recent years. So migratory birds fill the land and, uh, and the Arctic spring and summer, it's an amazing uh, our amazing season to witness and to live in. So in this environment, indigenous people have lived and continue to thrive um, and have lived for, for many, many generations and, and uh, over centuries. And uh, although things have changed uh, very quickly and quite dramatically, as you can see in the picture in the 1920s, uh, there is a picture of uh, an Inuit hunter who ha harvested a bear with a bow and arrow. Nowadays, the technology has changed. Um, people use rifle. Um, it's a modern society, but still very much... Um, tied and grounded into uh, traditional values and traditional culture and uh, a um, sense of connection uh, with the landscape and the animal. So um, people um, 
um, harvest for food for much of the year and continue to do so. But uh, as in the past, uh, they were doing it uh, um, and they were living more on the, on the, um, in camps. Now they are more in communities. And uh, uh, in the past, uh, um, it was more common. People would use a, a sled um, with the dogs. Uh, nowadays, uh, and uh, since since the sixties, progressively, progressively, um, skidoos and uh, motorized boats have been uh, utilized. But even though technology has changed, the connection remain very, very strong with the land and with the animal um, living in there. So this makes um, Inuit really, really, obviously, really, really knowledgeable about their the species they live uh, with, and. Um, and very, very good observers. So in my project, the way we um, monitor wildlife health and we monitor Wanskog South was blending together and use two approaches, including the scientific approach that has been used uh, conventionally in a standard way, to monitor wildlife health and in science in general, but also blending, utilizing Inuit knowledge, not only as a guidance, but really as a source of uh, information that can guide us in understanding uh, the, the environment, the land landscape. And the idea has been really to work together and learn from each other. And mainly I've been learning, I, I'm the one who has been learning from, um, from Inuit and their, and their knowledge. So the way we did the, the, day, the way we approach these was to really talking to people through doing interviews, um, interviews that were in with the, individual harvesters, women and men, but also facilitating conversation between people. So you see in the bottom picture, three harvesters talking together in a group interview. And then we also collected some samples that from the animals that uh, would uh, then uh, be utilized for laboratory analysis and for more scientific and traditional studies. Some of these samples um, were collected in the field and particip I participated in some of the collection, but heavily this sample co sampling collection really depended once again by the effort of uh, Inuit hunters who collected samples on the animals that they harvested for food. Um, and so there's been this uh, uh, great collaboration, not only to collect the samples, but also to decide which kind of sample to collect and how to, to collect them. So you would see here, you see here this little kit is a sampling kit that was designed with Inuit harvesters and to, took into a, to take into account the difficulties and the limitation that they have in the field, especially in the winter when temperatures are uh, can go um, to minus 60 very easily. And so uh, harvesting and collecting sample in an environment like this is very, very challenging. So what I would be, will be talking to you today is more the, the interview component and how we blend it together, this source of information. So what we really created here is a, a amazing collaborative project where everybody is learning and uh, it's collaborating hand by hand to understand, in this case, muskox health, but also to conserve muskox and people and help people who rely on them. 
So here I provide you some example and we get to the bean um, piece of the story. Um, so the methods that we use to collect it, to, to, to document Inuit knowledge um, is a method that has been used uh, and developed for many, many years, but has been used in different parts of the world, mainly in Africa and Southeast Asia, and comes from um, participatory research. Participatory research means uh, that uh, people are engaged in the research process. There's uh, um, there's a specific method to to um, to conduct to perform interviews that is also um, rely also very much on. Um, ex very, very pragmatic and practical exercises. Some of these are mapping, they're called participatory because there's people participating in it and sharing their knowledge and documenting from and document and the documentation of this information is through these, uh, these process of participation. Um, there's mapping, obviously, as you can see here, um, a harvester pointing on a map where he made an observation. There's drawing um, on, on graphs. There's uh, creating a timeline of, timeline of, timeline of events, um, meaning that um, uh, people, for example, recalled uh, their life, major events, when they first observed some species, when they last observed some, and uh, so they were able to put on these on these uh, uh, scale uh, along uh, along the years all their observations. And then something that we relied heavily on were the beans. And this is called proportional piling. That means that we have a pile of beans and we divide this pile in a proportional way. So, and this has been very, very useful to create, to create quantities. So not only, uh, not only translate what people would observe and would say in a more uh, narrative way and a more qualitative way, saying I've seen a lot of these, not much of these, etc., into uh, more um, quantifiable um, um, pieces and so into numbers specifically. So I'm sure that you've done much of these and especially if you are a, a wildlife enthusiast probably you've done it as you uh, and you're still doing it so for example i'll give you some example that you may already that may remind you of things that you've probably done so maybe you've done also participatory mapping maybe um you you drew and you know that close to a farm uh, there are some natural features that you're drawing and then you know that uh, in the stream close to this farm there's some fish there's trouts and uh, maybe you also observed across the woods uh, some tracks and those tracks uh, are possibly a red fox uh, or maybe it's a dog, but uh, you think you've seen a red red fox. So there you go. So that's uh, that's in a nutshell is uh, is a mapping, is a participatory mapping. Or maybe if you're thinking about uh, a calendar of event, uh, um, and we are thinking about uh, school, um, the school year. Well, we know that from for me from September to June, I knew that I was um, busy in school, and that uh, here in the yellow spots is when I knew there were some vacation time, and so I could organize myself to 
for to uh, do efficiently my homework, but also to spend and enjoy some time together with friends and family. So these are very, very um, basic example of what uh, uh, this participatory process look like, but it is to show you that this is something that uh, you already do and you can do um, very efficiently too. So just to give you an example of uh, what a seasonal calendar look like, um, um, it may look like this, where we, uh, on this part, we have all the months. And here we are looking at the species that in a, sp in a area of the Arctic um, may be occurring. So with seals, uh, different type of seals, different type of whales, ducks, fish. And then we can draw a line that represents when this seal is, uh, is in the environment, uh, when, when this seal is seen, when they have the denning time, when they have their pups, etc. All constructed using through through interviews with uh, um, indigenous knowledge holders. In this case, um, th in this case, was done uh, this particularly as an exercise in the Eastern Arctic. So, how do we use the beans then? So, what we do is to um, to use a pile of beans. This pile can be um, is generally a fixed volume. It can be a hundred beans. It can be half a kilo of beans. It can be a hundred uh, gram of beans. But the concept is that you have a pile of something that you can count. So then you formulate a question. So the beans obviously can represent anything you want. You formulate a question and then you ask uh, people to work in a collaborative way to separate this pile in a way that is proportional. So the more beans there are, the more animals you've seen, for example. So maybe those beans represent all the animals, all the muskoxen and that uh, you've seen in a year. And uh, the question is to divide them uh, according to the, the proportion of adult animal and young animal. And so then the bigger the pile, the bigger that group uh, of animal is. So when people have finished dividing the counters and they are happy with uh, the little piles, then we count them, we measure them. Either we count them if there were just a hundred beans or we measure them with a measuring cup, for example. And that's create some percentage, some, some percentages and some numbers that can be used very effectively uh, in the context of wildlife health, uh, in the context of understanding wildlife health and monitoring it. So now I give you a couple of examples on how all of these was used in the context of musk oxen in Cambridge Bay. So here is a graph that shows you the years on the bottom axis, and then some numbers from zero to 100 in the vertical axe. This zero to 100 represent percentages, so are, they are not absolute number. But this, what we were able to do with interviews was to uh, outline a trend line that is understanding how muskoxen in this area are doing the number, how the number are fluctuating, are changing over the years. So in the 60s, 70s, the number weren't very high. And then by the set around the 70s, numbers started to increase, reach their peak in the late 90s, and then started to decline very rapidly in a matter of um, um, in a, in a matter of uh, a couple of decades. So really it's 
and returned back even lower than what were they were back in the 60s. So really here, we are not really interested in the, in the no total number of animals, but we are interested in understanding how that uh, um, population is doing. We, we call these a trend, a trend line. And here with this uh, uh, plane, what I wanted to show you, what I wanted to, to highlight is that in an environment such as the Arctic, it's very, very different, difficult to count the animals at regular intervals. So in the context of Muscoxen, like absolute numbers, so a census, an estimation of the number was done through a counting animal through airplane that is called the aerial survey. So numbers were available for the, in the late 90s, and then it took several years to take another, to do another aerial survey. Of course, it's very expensive. There's a lot of logistics and there's many limitations also um, when doing this type of uh, uh, studies. So we had for many, many years, we didn't know with uh, scientific science, uh, with uh, scientific knowledge that uh, the number were this low. But by interviewing people, we, un we understood that the change had been really dramatic. So now, now we can easily count this difference from this point to this point. But we can also use our beans and say, well, if these are all the muskoxen at the population peak, how many of those then are still seen in 2014? And so very, very little. So and these with these, um, this gives a very um, straightforward measure of the decline that was in this case uh, of around 85% in the, in the area around uh, the community that was observed by people we interviewed. The same thing we did then uh, looking at the proportion of adult animals and young animals. So the adults are in this picture, these big guys with the uh, horns very visible and the young animals is this calf here and um, and also yearling, a little bit older, um, so the one year old. So again, what something that definitely wasn't available and that aerial survey couldn't tell because um, you see the animals from far away, so you're not really able to tell very uh, easily and very accurately um, how many adults may be there, how many young may be there. Um, so, but in with that travel on land and see the animals uh, very often are really able to, 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 to record and understand this difference, uh, to see it and remember it. So they shared a change in the, in the proportion of adults and young animals. So if we are had to translate these in beans, there were before the 90s, 75 beans of adults. And uh, in 2014, when the decline that happened, there were 90. And for juveniles, it was the opposite. There were 25 in before the decline happened. And then after the decline, 10 had remained. But then it's not only about uh, uh, only about understanding numbers and proportion of the population, but also understanding um, the health, um, how these uh, animals are doing, uh, if people have, are, have seen a uh, sign of diseases and what they look like. And so again, here the beans show you very, very easily that uh, the bigger the pile, the bigger the, the number of, uh, the bigger that category, category is. And so, for example, still the majority of the animal were considered healthy, and then some were seen dead, some unhealthy, and then some 
uh, of the unhealthy ones, some of them had uh, some lesions. And what's very important here is not, uh, um, it's also things that count only one bean. Also, one bean in this context can be very, very important. And this is an example that show you how also scientific knowledge was uh, and the scientific methods was very useful in this context. So we had to, we knew of one animal, we were collecting samples. So we knew of one animal was seen with discabi lesions on, on the nose. We were able to go on the field site that was quite far away from Cambridge Bay and collect additional sample and bring it back with a float plane in the summer. And in the lab, some colleagues had de detected Orph virus, which is uh, a, a, which was the first time that was detected in uh, in muskoxen on Victoria Island and uh, um, in the Canadian Arctic in general. And that's if we had to stop there. This is what we knew. But because we were doing an interview and talking to people, then we were able to put those observations into context. And people had said that in reality, they did observe those lesions even uh, 10 years before uh, the first confirmation. And so this shows the powerful, uh, the power of this approach, power of uh, um, talking to people, collecting sample and blending all of these together. But this is not only about uh, um, monitoring wildlife and collecting information and documenting knowledge, but all this process really build trust is an amazing uh, experience, creates amazing friendship. People feel engaged in identifying um, problems, but also uh, solutions, uh, possible solutions. And so this is provides really uh, working with beans and working with people um, and working all together and collaborate really provides, uh, is, a, is a really powerful tool and powerful experience uh, um, for conservation and to help uh, wildlife people and this amazing environment. So, and with this, I, I thank you all for, for your attention. And I provide here a website of to, if you wanna learn a little bit more about what you do, what I'm doing, and uh, want to uh, see um, some of the, uh, some videos of the research here. It's a website where my website, where you can go and uh, explore and my email if uh, anyone wants co to connect uh, later on. Perfect. Matilda, thank you so much. If you want to exit screen share, that's great. We are quite long into the broadcast, so I know we probably only have time for one question from our classes, but if you guys want to stick around, we'll go a little bit later than usual today. Um, let's start with our, our uh, YouTube groups, and then I'll come to Mr. Ameros and our Irma Colson two schools to wrap up. Uh, we'll see if we can get to the 50-minute mark. Uh, Ms. Ulette's class, they're in Ottawa today. They want to know, what draws you to the animal kingdom? Like, you talked about this love of animals. You have the chance to work with a lot of different fantastic creatures. Is there anything specific? that you know sort of support that for you when you were younger yes i'm i think um uh i always uh, i grew up with animals uh when i was young my family my grandparents had a lot of cats dogs more pets and um but really what really sparked my interest in wildlife and conservation was um a trip that I uh, did with my parents. I was uh, joining a citizen science uh, uh, project uh, looking at whales in the Mediterranean Sea. And that was uh, an amazing experience. Uh, I did it when I was 13. That really sparked my interest and, and keep, kept me determined to continue on this path. Fantastic. Anyone who's ever had the chance to see whales, they are just a spectacular animal, kind of animal. <laughs> I hope everyone gets that chance to live because they're really, really special. Um, Mr. Romero's virtual school joining us in Sudbury today. If you want to come on in and ask a question, you're good to go. Hey. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, we had a, a question in our class. We were wondering, are there any traditions you learn from the Inuit people that you still use? Well, uh, I I learned a lot when I was uh, in the in the field on how to, and I learned a lot by talking to people on how they lived um, and how to keep warm in the winter too. So something actually, um, um, that something that I learned was to um, use uh, the kivut of muskoxen, which is the undercoat of muskoxen. I have a sample here. And it's a very, very fine, fine uh, wall uh, to put, to take that and put in, in the mittens and boots in the winter. And that keeps you warm. And that's really true. And I've done it and it's, it's saved my toes. <laughs> I love that you had the prop like right there. It's always there good. you go. <laughs> quite amazing. Uh, you know, I, I've heard this from many Arctic explorers, Antarctic explorers. When they use the modern gear, they use the plastics and all the polyethylene. It's, and it's, it's good. But compared to polar bear, compared to muskox, all these things that people have been using for thousands of years, it doesn't even hold a candle to it. So I'm so glad. Absolutely. Glad yeah. <laughs> um, our five twos at Irma Colson, let's head to the English class first. And we'll come to Ms. Anderson's in just a second. Hey, five twos, just unmute your mic. Come on in. Say hello. Hello. There you are, <laughs> bottom of your screen, big microphone symbol. You're good. Okay. Okay. So okay. Let's take the question. Zion, what type of animals did you see when you were young? Yeah, so when you were younger, back in... What type of animals? So sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, did you see when you were young? So when you were much younger doing this sort of stuff, it's sort of, you talked about oh. the way already, but anything else? Yes, I've seen, well, turtle, in, I seen mainly wildlife in Italy, so turtle... I've seen uh, ibex. We have a lot of mountain uh, animals in Italy. Ibex, deers, uh, foxes. Uh, foxes, more foxes are on my house. Hedgehogs and things like that. Very, very, very different compared to the musk oxen. But uh, even in your backyard, you can, you can be amazed on the biodiversity uh, that you can find. Uh, insects, uh, and uh, in, especially in the insects. Yeah. So you can absolutely explore just in your backyard. Hey, that's what we're all about for our classes that know. We do backyard bio every May, getting hundreds of classes around the world out exploring <laughs> exactly that, their backyard, their schoolyard, all that good stuff. But I'm so glad you mentioned hedgehogs and foxes because like as a Canadian, our backyards are like raccoons and skunks. <laughs> and like, that's great. We love those creatures, some of us. Um, but like, <laughs> the idea of having a hedgehog sort of trundle through the garden is a really special thing. So, and um, moles, a lot of moles. See, My father know. is not very happy about oh, that. Like, but but they are moles, are moles are cuter than groundhogs. I'll give them that. <laughs> uh, let's head to Ms. Anderson's group. I, I know you guys have stayed a little long, so thank you so much for that. Uh, unmute your mic and come on in, Irma Colson. Hi, guys. Hello. But you got to unmute. There we are. Perfect. Hi. Have you Hi. ever seen an Arctic wolf? Ooh, Arctic wolf. Yes. I have. Um, I have only once. And it was very close to Cambridge Bay, actually. We were doing some uh, field work. And we saw this animal at our first. We thought it was a husky. And then it was really clear that he wasn't a husky, but he was an Arctic wolf. And it was uh, amazing to see this uh, majestic animal going through the tundra. And as it came, it disappeared right away. Yeah. There's um, a recent series, Seven Worlds, One Planet. And so it's a BBC series. Some of the kids might have seen Blue Planet or Planet Earth. And they have some Arctic wolves uh, hunting uh, musk ox, actually, up in Canada's Arctic. It's one of the most special series, one of the most special scenes I've ever seen in a documentary. In fact, it's in and around some of the places Matilda's had the chance to work. So I really encourage people to check that out. Um, time flies and you're having fun. So we are at the end of the broadcast, but you did highlight if people want to reach out to you, learn more about the work that you're doing. You've got this website. You highlighted that as well. Any teachers that want that, we'll make sure you guys get the link. And of course, this program made possible by Polar Knowledge Canada. So cool we get a chance to work with an actual Polar Knowledge Canada scientist. It's so neat to be able to 
explore these places, interact and, and work with such amazing people. And so thank you so much for sharing your, your story with us today, Matilda. It's been very special. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for listening and reach, reach out anytime. Yeah. Well, Matilda, it's your first time. So what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our Irma Colson Schools and Mr. Romero. You guys want to unmute your microphones and join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. You are all in the broadcast. Thank, thank you so you much. Everybody.